I'm going to I mean, uh, deliver two lectures today. So one is about the introduction to Chinese politics, uh, which is more like a historical perspective, uh, which particularly emphasizes and studies the rise of the Chinese Communist Party. I, I even you know, try to go back to uh, the collapse of Qing Dynasty, and I focus on the 1920s, how and why would the Chinese Communist Party uh, rise up. And then um, the second part of, the, of, of this lecture will be something like domestic politics. So uh, the China shift to the 1950s, uh, land reforms, uh, anti rightist campaign, and even later on cultural revolution, and how to try to get through that kind of uh, economic and also political tumors within China uh, until seizing the of cost. The focus would be uh, more you know, uh, in the earlier part the former part about you know from 1950s to um, 1990s because after 1990s there's not much controversial issue so this is the emphasis of that lecture so uh, the second lecture will, will be about something um, on party ideology so I'll come to this later so um, the first thing is about uh, the rise of the CCP from a historical perspective how many of you have uh, actually uh, seen something like this before I mean the the, the, the photo here. can you just you know jump in and tell me what you think about this is this is a, a, a time for two uh, I would say countries uh, the first half of them to formally I mean, meet up with each other but can you guess um, who are those audience here? any idea? so on the, on, the, on the left hand side and you have this is not very clear but I mean this is actually a form European? European, yes. And you can see that uh, he has one leg new down. Right. And guess who is this person here? Mm -hmm. Chen Long, right? Chen Long. So if you refer to the I mean, um, style of the program, uh, this is something in Chen Dynasty. And Chen Long, uh, the emperor, uh, is the strongest emperor within Chen Dynasty. So uh, this is actually a uh, party, the delegate from uh, the United Kingdom, uh, from Britain. Uh, anyone knows the, the topic or the conversations here? Uh, what, what did they discuss actually in this bit? Trade. Trade, yes, that's correct. Apart from trade, any, anything that you can spot out, which is something that you can hear? Foreign relations. I mean, in the past, if you refer to China, uh, China, uh, the name uh, in Chinese, what we call Zhongguo, and in English, it means the Middle Kingdom. And what's the meaning of the Middle Kingdom here? Middle Kingdom. Uh, the power point we will send to all of you. Dr. Lee is happy to share the power yeah, I, I will send so we don't need to copy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what's the meaning of the Middle Kingdom here? Any guess here? But well, this is about the mentality of the Chinese dynasty. Uh, capital? Middle, middle Kingdom. Middle Kingdom it means actually the center of the world. It means that the Chinese dynasty, I mean, uh, it used to be for so many uh, years, more than 2,000 years, uh, the Chinese regarded themselves as the center of the world. So there's, there was the Chibu system. The Chibu system means that you know, other people if you come from you know somewhere outside of China, then you will be automatically regarded as barbarians. So when you have the difference between superior civilization versus the barbarians, it means that you have the hierarchy. So it's not equal for king status. Um, I would say in this picture, the British delegate would try to uh, uh, resist, would try to you know uh, oppose this kind of tribal system because from the Western perspective. After the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, with those European countries trying to sign a treaty and saying that you know, every country should be regarded as equal, regardless of your size, regardless of your power and your populations. So this is not something acceptable that when you meet with the Chinese standard, you have to uh, not only kneel down with both legs, but also kowtow. Do you know what's the name for kowtow in China? I, I don't want to show it to you here, kowtow. <laughs> But actually, you know, I mean, for European practice, when they meet with the end, when they were trying to have one leg down first. But when you have to meet with the Chinese end, then you will have two legs down, and then you have to count up. Okay? You have to count up. 
And cow cow tao. This is now this is now English, okay? Uh, you can find cow tao uh, in the Oxford dictionary. Cow tao, just like kung fu, okay? This can be found in the dictionary. <laughs> Thank you. This is for accurate explanations here. So you, can, <laughs> so you could imagine that how can you expect a form from the United Kingdom, uh, which you know uh, he, I mean, does not supposed to present counter sentiment even to their own enemy. So uh, they negotiate a lot for more than three months because of that sentiment. So finally, the Chinese emperor said that that's fine. Uh, just present what you did to, I mean, your, 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 your you know, emperor in the UK that is fine. But, I mean, um, the incident here shows that actually you have the crash of values, you have the crash of ideas between China and the United Kingdom. Part of that is because of trade. The tribute system would argue that, you know, uh, if you pay tribute to China, that you will you may grant for let's say three months to six months for, for training within China, then you can bring it put it back to your your country. But this is granted, okay, within certain kind of conditions. And one of them is that you have to admit that China is more superior than your own place. So this is the first prerequisite. So apart from trade, <coughs> the second thing is that you, know, you will have to accept what China will try to protect you. So uh, your country or your tribe would be a kind of protectorate of uh, China. So anyway, this is something unfair, I would say. Um, and China also did something uh, wrong. He attempted to show the Chinese capability to the British delegate, but at that time, uh, he, didn't, he, he didn't know that actually you know, he was the great power in Europe. And then he showed the soldiers in the Brooklyn city in Beijing to uh, the British delegate, but actually practiced a spear, arrow, you know, not much about gunpowder stuff, or cannon. And then the British delegate, um, when he went back to the UK, he put the case to the British Empire. And this actually invited the British people to come to China for asking war. But for asking war based on temporal policy, based on power. And I would say this is one of the turning points for China uh, to decline. So uh, at least some internal um, rebellion scene and also external threat including opium war and the later one, China was defeated by Japan. And also you have the Boxer War, actually you have uh, eight European countries that invade China, and the Chinese government actually threatened to our cases. So uh, this is the background. So uh, let's move on a bit. The Chinese Communist Party actually uh, wiser in uh, the period around 1912 or to 1920 because of the internal chaos in China. Um, so on the right hand side, uh, up here, but this is a, this is a group of tribe. You have different uh, red circle and you have uh, two blue circles. On, on the back here, okay, um, the two blue circles here, it represents the Nationalist Party. Because after the establishment of the people's, uh, sorry, of the Republic of China, which, which is, you know, established by Dr. Sun Yat-sen, and this is the first republic in China. And uh, some differential political officers actually disagree with Dr. Sun and Sen, and then they're trying to establish their own sphere of influence in China. So technically, this is not a united China. And uh, we call this is the warlord. And you have different warlords in different parts of China. Um, and uh, the Nationalist Party will try to reunite China again. Uh, so this is the situation. And at that time, actually, it's the first time that the Trust Communist Party cooperate with the Nationalist Party. They try to, you know, launch the Lofton expeditions. But in the middle part of that Lofton expeditions, uh, the Nationalist Party will try to just expel all those communist uh, comrades because of the threat of the rising of the ideas of communism within China. And in 1927, something actually, the Nationalist Party killed more than 10,000 Chinese communists in Shanghai. Uh, and then the Chinese Communist Party divided in two groups. One group argues that we should stay in the city to confront with the Nationalist Party. But the other group would say that, you know, we should go to the village, we should go to the rural area, to the countryside. The first group actually argues that 
why we have to stay in the city? Because, you know, according to the Western experience, according to Marxism, most of the supporters are in the cities. So that's why we have to stay in the cities. But Mao Zedong actually, he is the second group. He argues that the situation in China is not the same with the Western experience. Because China at that time was not yet industrialized. So you don't have much workers in the cities. In contrast, you have many people in the rural areas. So that's why the source of support should be in the rural side, in the countryside here. And the split here, the first group said the cities they died, most of most of them died, or were, you know, wiped by the Nationalist Party. Uh, the second group, led by you know much on later on, they established the Tianxi Soviet um, somewhere, you know, uh, next to the Fujian province, and they try to resist uh, the attack from the Nationalist Party. So uh, the Chinese Soviets here, um, roughly, well, you have different circles here. So this is the base of the Chinese Communist Party at that time. Anyone know what they did at that time when they established the Chinese Soviets? How would they call this? Is the Jiangxi Soviets? Jiangxi is the name of the province. But when you say this is Jiangxi Soviets, it means that this is not owned by the Nationalist Party anymore. So they did something different from the Nationalist Party. If you were Mao Zedong, if you established the Soviet, what do you want to do actually? And you believe in communism. And you think that the villages, they are the supporters, that the potential supporters, so what were you trying to do? Any guess here? Protect them. Protest. Uh, who protests whom, actually? Farmers. Farmers, okay. Uh, but you want to do something more actually. You're going to do an experiment. So what Marjorie did at that time is they launch the land reform. The land reform, um, it means that you know they try to confiscate the land from the land owners and then we distribute the land to those poor persons. So when the poor persons, they, they were the majority, when they received the land, they're happy because in the past they they need to work with the you know landlords or landowners, but now they have uh, pieces of land they can cultivate the crops themselves and then they build something right. So this is a very early beginning of the collectivization, and this is a test. This is an experiment here, and then apart from that, they also try to establish some sort of cooperation among those you know people in the village. So this is the very fundamental form of the collectives, I would say. They work with each other, they try to cooperate with each other. So um, the Jiangxi Soviet at that time is quite successful, so that's when they expand to other uh, parts of the countryside. Uh, but Guomindong, which is the name of the Nationalist Party, uh, which was led by Chiang Kai-shek, he, he's not very happy about this because of the threat of the rise of the Transcommunist Party. So that's why he ordered five encirclement campaigns with the help of the German weapons and then they try to launch the military um, campaigns against those uh, Soviet uh, forces in Jiangxi Soviet and then the Chinese Communist Party retreat. And later on, this is a very well, well known law march. Because they retreat, right? So this is the Jiangxi Soviet. When, when the Nationalist Party tried to tackle the Soviets one by one here, uh, this is the only one left here. Uh, and much of them thought that they, they wouldn't make it. I mean, in a long term. So that's why the best means is to escape to one of them. So, but they call this is the Long March. So the Long March actually it took place from you know October 1934 to you know 1935, one year, and uh, more than one year and 6,000 miles. Okay, and then roughly according to Mao Zedong uh, and those records, they would say uh, you have major battles with the Nationalist Party every five days. Would you could you imagine that? If you count on a small scale conflict, more than that. And then the tactics is guerrilla tactics because you know the victory capability of the Communist Party is not so great when you compare with the Nationalist Party. So that's why they, I mean, launch the law march with the guerrilla tactics. So the guerrilla tactics means that you know when they, when the Nationalist Party attack, then you retreat. But the Nationalist Party station in a in a pace that you try to attack them, right? But when they advance again, then you reach them again. So uh, this is how good they survive. Uh, but under Marjong's military uh, leadership, 
um, he was finally, you know, uh, and, and recognized by other colleagues in the Communist Party, and then um, he be became uh, the top leader. Uh, and uh, the Zheng Yi conference actually uh, somewhere here in uh, Vietnam. Okay, the conference actually recognized Mao positions, and you know this is how he would consider the power here. Uh, another case is that you know you have the Japanese occupations uh, in the northeast of China. So that's why you have the second United Front. And um, those Chinese communists, you know, communists were trying to cooperate with the National Party again because of the external threats from Japan. So this is what we call the second United Front here. Um, and uh, in this photo, who is Marjikong actually? I guess you recognize who is Marjikong, right? And this is Zhao Nai, the Chinese uh, period. Uh, don't ask me, uh, the two gentlemen say, I have no idea who they are. Uh, only Marjo Dung and also Zhou Enlai. I keep asking some, someone, but I couldn't find the names anyway. So this is the Japanese occupations, you know, from 1941 to 1945, and that's when you have the core push again between the two parties. Um, but after that, you have the civil war. Once the Japanese um, was defeated, then immediately the problem is about who's going to be the ruler of China. Is it going to be the Nationalist Party or whether Mao Zedong <coughs> he has a choice to, I mean, uh, take up the positions from the Nationalist Party, right? So you have the civil war. Uh, the two great leaders actually, they met in Chongqing, western part of China, for a talk, <coughs> a peaceful talk. But it's not quite successful because, you know, uh, Jiang, uh, Jiang actually, uh, Jiang, Jiang Jai said, he actually uh, fought that. The Communist Party will be removed very soon, with the support of the American forces behind. But Mao Zedong would say something different. Because the Soviet, uh, when they attacked the Japanese troops in northeastern part of China, the Soviet uh, actually left a lot of weapons to the Communist Party, but not the Nationalist Party. So that's why uh, the CCP armed forces was upgraded, because of the Soviet help. And uh, the other, another reason about the failure of the you know, Nationalist Party is about the internal corruption in Guam no, the Nationalist Party, internal corruption. So many people actually, I mean, ordinary people, they, they just get disappointed with the um, Nationalist Party. So they want something new. They want to have a clean government, and more importantly, a fair distribution of resources, for example, land. So those people, when they taste the Jiangxi Soviet experience, they were trying to support the Transparency Party, but not the Nationalist Party. And um, the CCP also called this is a new democracy because they trying to, I mean, um, redistribute the resources in the society according to the least, right? But not those people uh, who are rich. Um, another reason is about nationalism, but this is less argued by scholars. But I would say part of the reason, perhaps maybe, some people want to have a united China, a strong China after the war. Um, but look at that. This is the figures for the increasing Chinese Communist Party's membership uh, from 40,000 in 1947. 1947, this is the year after the Long March. But in 1940, the size doubled to 800,000. So it emerged that if the Nationalist Party actually can convince the people we are capable to gather. We are, you know, queen, we are queen government, we can accommodate your interest. Those people, they're not going to join the Chinese Communist Party, right? So the fact couldn't tell something wrong, right? So I would say this is another turning point within China, but this is the turning point from the mass, from the ordinary people, but not from external forces. <coughs> um, so part two here, I will spend more time on that because you know uh, it's more complicated for the transitions of the domestic politics in, in China. So uh, we start from 1950s here. So um, we have three photos here again. Uh, could you guess what they are doing here in the, in the photos? Any idea? Public executions? Um, no. Is <laughs> <laughs> a protest? It's something like politics, but m m much more structural than politics. Also, oh, here is here, actually, uh, the war against the landowners, the, the landowners. Okay, um, but this is a protest. Well, this is something that what you have mentioned, but this is more structuralized. They try to take out every landowner, the landowner, and then they were trying to, you know, ask land landowners to, I mean, uh, give the land back to the people. 
and they try to criticize the landlords, landowners. And as you can see from the image here, someone will try to, you know, just give a fist to that landowner, but it's quite violent. Uh, this uh, person that just stole one of the landlords um, in the public square here, and uh, the landowner on the left-hand side of the photo here, well, he actually kneeled down both legs. So you can imagine the situation at that time is quite chaotic. Um, but because of the Chinese Communist Party's name before, the idea just followed the Jiangxi Soviet, what they did in 1927 and 8 something. Um, you confiscate the land from the rich people, and then you redistribute the land to the poor peasants. So you make the majority of people happy. But honestly, I would say, those poor persons or those other people, they have no idea what's that mean for Marxism, or what's that mean for communism. When you receive the land, you're happy, right? Then you are not going to doubt anymore about, well, how could we move forward to, you know, uh, communism here? Because you have the bread, right? You have the land, right? You're, you're happy. So uh, this is how would the Transformers Party try to attract the majority poor people. And it's quite successful. So this is the most struggle we can get the landowners here, and then they can try to redistribute the land uh, to the poor. Uh, so this is the statistics here. Um, we have different categories here. Uh, so this is the household, uh, this is the population, arable land here, and this is you know uh, per uh, uh, the unit here, the land unit here. And you have the poor peasants, uh, middle peasants, rich peasants, and landowners and others. And the bracket, the numbers in the bracket is actually um, the biggest after we distribute. So if you refer to the poor presence, okay, uh, if you refer to the men, well, they are the majority of people, right? 57% uh, in terms of household. Nearly half of, half of those persons actually uh, dominate, you know, uh, in China, right? Half of them are from poor class. Uh, but in terms of the men, uh, you can see before the land reform, the class here actually only got 14 points and 8 something. But after the land reform, uh, the poor present class actually got more than 47.1 something. And in terms of the, you know, per, you know, uh, household units here, you can also find you have the increasing figures here. So uh, this is the, you know, um, beneficiary class here. And what about the widow peasants? I would say slightly increased, but not a good increase when you compare with the poor persons. But actually, they also got more land when you compare with the land reform before. Uh, rich persons and also landowners, it's just opposite because the land were redistributed to the poor and middle persons here. Uh, so uh, basically, you know, uh, this is done in the ni early 1950s. So starting from 1950. Uh, to 1952 or something, uh, and then later on, um, you have the fundamental agricultural transformations. I mean, the land reform is the prerequisite for something. Marginal the most logic is that if you want to have collectivizations, the first thing you will have to get back the land. If you can get the land from the land owners, right, and then you redistribute the poor persons, and then those poor persons that can form the cooperatives. So you have two types of um, what I call cooperatives here. Yes. Yes, sure. This is not the yeah. poor persons. If you look at the population, yeah. there's not much change. Yeah, yeah. But we get an idea that, you know, a lot of, and if you look at the rich persons, again, uh, population wise, it doesn't much change. Yeah, but you have the wise of the rich persons, right? Huh? You have the wise of the rich persons, right? In terms of the percentage. Uh, no, I, uh, what I'm trying, what I am trying to say is that, so, uh, you know, kind of population wise, there wasn't much change. I didn't know the categories. Yeah, but the population is within the same. But the poor class, they actually got to born in, not population. So I think what, uh, I also have the same thing, I think what uh, suggested if I'm wrong, if I, yeah. uh, the category of poor people doesn't change, even after getting the land. That, yeah. that remains the same there. Uh, Maybe some definitional problems. The poor, yeah. again, we are literally the same. Poor yeah, cannot be again two persons. Or maybe this group of people. Yeah, they they mean, mean, uh, now they are 
decline only few percentages. See, I think there is something metabolism problem. So those people got more like uh, you mean which 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 caste? How do you call them poor? Poor. For example, if you look at the landowners, yeah. now the land size has declined to some point two, which is less than the poor persons. Okay. Average. Sir, please explain. So assume that before the land reform, yeah. the land was primarily with the rich person. Yeah. Okay. And after the land reform, it has been redistributed. Is that the correct assumption? So why are they still poor? Yeah, why? It has been given to the poor. Oh, oh okay. That's, 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 that's what that's happened. Right? No? Land owners has but then how can it be almost the same? Well, yeah, this is a good question. Because the, the classification says that, you know, the landowners at that time, they still have not yet been abolished. And still, uh, you have the categories of poor peasants. It's the very early transformations. When I move on later, what I'm going to talk about is the agricultural producer cooperatives and also the people's coming later on. You have no more classes among those people anymore. But at that time, you know, um, when you refer to the land reform, they just try to do the category according to the previous status. And then this is the target for them to register the land. But later on, when you have the cooperate cooperatives, when you have collectivizations, you cannot say that I'm still a rich person or landowners because there's no more classes anymore. The percentage is different. That percentage is also is only percentage. Yeah, only percentage. Don't, don't look at the comparison. We are most informed. Only the last Arab land distribution and the average land size. That's a change. Only the last column. We have to look at the change. All the columns referring. Uh, static at a yeah. point of time. You are looking at the what is the distribution from 100. And, and one more thing is that you know, uh, oh. if you refer to the uh, let me let me jump. If you refer to the anti whiteist campaign, they don't want 1957. Those people who suffer actually they are the rich people. They're still the people who maintain in the kinds of let's say the category of rich people, you know, um, or middle or even maybe you know, uh, landowner. We still have that. Classes, but the men were redistributed uh, to the peasants. So those, I mean, uh, classes, why they were still here? Because they're one of the potentials or one of the you know targets that much were trying to reorganize the whole society's transformations in terms of the class. So that's why the capitalism here, um, if you refer to, they still refer to what they are the poor peasants, and you still have some men on this here. But I would say after 1957 so, and the so people's coming, yes. The title so, is after land reform. That's why we are. Uh, uh, oh, <laughs> so, so we will we will look at it uh, like very early uh, data immediately after land reform. So yes. their condition not changed yet, but just the lands are distributed. So we'll look at yes. the last point. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Oh, sorry for the mistake. Mistake information here. I should elaborate here. Sorry about that. Okay. Which class originate the background here? Um, well, I don't get to say this is the case, but I mean, um, technically after the land reform, uh, if you go back to uh, that kind of chaotic period, um, but actually my, my wife's uh, grandfather actually, uh, they suffered at that time period. Uh, my wife's grandfather, he was rich people, and the name was distributed to the poor peasants, but still the kind of, you're rich people, then you, you are still the rich people, even though you have double tech. But later on, when you go to the 1957 big anti whiteist campaign, the anti whiteist campaign means that you know, we, we were trying to target this, um, what we call bourgeois, rich people, landowners. And then when much the move forward for the people's culture, there's no more castes in the society. So, um, so the stigma yeah. of which class you originated from still speak to? Yes, yes. So they still, what? they still hate those people, actually, I would say. So that's why the whiteist campaign four years later, and then those people were tied. Um, so thank you. So let me uh, move on a bit. Okay. So uh, well, this is the foundations of the um, agricultural 
transformations. When those poor patients, when they got NAM, then um, you found the base. So we have two types of uh, agricultural producer cooperatives. One is the lower level, and the other is the higher level. Uh, and then the ultimate one, this is the people's economy. So for the lower level, of, uh, I would say this is the ABC, agricultural producer cooperatives. So basically you have uh, about 25 to 50 families together. Uh, they still hold some sort of private ownership. So basically it means that if you work harder, if you work longer, then you can earn some money. So you offer some incentive for those people to work, to maintain their cooperatives. Uh, two of the draft animals were pulled. It means that this is a bit too, uh, a kind of reform here. You give, you, you, you give them a taste that you know what's that mean for sharing. So two can, can, can share, draft animals can share. Uh, and then um, another thing is about the policy. The officers in the cooperative he or she will decide which kind of crops that we're going to grow. But then this is something different from the capitalist economy. Because every individual household you should have your own rights and choice to determine what kind of crops that I want to grow. Right? But in the lower level of the APC then you have the officials to provide a guideline what kind of crops that we're going to grow here. And you also have the red points system here. The red points system actually uh, is that you know, it refers to the private ownership. If you work hard, if you work uh, in the longer term of payment, then you can be paid more. So this is the lower level. So I would say this is a small reform. But when you be when we come to the high level of the APC here, they try to put different lower level of the APC together. Because one lower level of the APC is one unit. And then you put different lower APC into a larger unit to form the higher level of the APC. So it contains a one more than or around two hundred and fifty families. Uh, but in terms of the you know collectivizations, it's much higher. The land owned collectively, and you have to farm collectively. So this is another advancement of collectivizations. And payment system here, uh, they only refer to labor contributions, not other stuff. Okay. Um, this is the photo. Well, this is about one of the you know uh, meeting of that cooperative. And they also eat in the, I mean, uh, dining hall later on. I mean, you have the great dining hall, you eat together, you work together, but this is the people's commune, so I will, I will just come back to a second, maybe skip this one. The people's commune here, okay, uh, you have around 5,000 to 25,000 families. And uh, all of the stuff, okay, uh, including distribution, production, consumption, you know, um, most of them actually you have to work together. No more private ownership. So this is even a higher stage of collectivizations. Okay. So I will come back to this later. But I mean, uh, this is the situations for lower level, high level PPCs, and uh, what happened in the urban area. We have, we just talk about the rural area. Right? In the urban area, um, you you also have the war against the industrialist capitalists here. Uh, you just make the companies nationalize a national company. Uh, state or enterprises, okay, you just try to confiscate the I mean, wealth from uh, the private business. So this is the photo that they try to change the name of one of the companies uh, by turning it from private company to a national company here. Um, I put how did Hong Kong benefit from it because I come from Hong Kong. So at that time when you have the collectivizations in China, and some of the entrepreneurs or you know rich people in China, if they can afford it, that they will try to you know bring their capitals and also machineries from different major cities in China, let's say Shanghai, Beijing, Tianjin, and they would just go to Hong Kong. And uh, interestingly, later on, when uh, the Cultural Revolution broke out, and then you have another second wave of those people who fled to Hong Kong. Uh, but those people when they arrive Hong Kong because they have the capital and they have the machineries, the industrial machineries. When China started reforms in 1970s and 80s something, it's not about foreign direct investment, it's about the TPEs. And the TPEs, the, this is the Township and Village Enterprises. And it's the Hong Kong case. It's the Chinese dispor to go back to China for investment. It's not the foreign direct investment, I mean, in the first wave. So um, I would say, those people, they skip China in 1950s or maybe in the 1960s. They keep the capital, they have the knowledge, 
And then later on, when you have reform, they go back to China. And somehow they save China. I mean, they save China's future, I would say. So this is quite interesting. Uh, anyway, um, the Whitey's campaign actually just happened before the people's come with the Whitney forward. Okay? So the Whitey's campaign actually, um, part of the reason is, is about political reason. Martin will try to find out those people who disagree with the collectivization sport. And then when you spot them, and then you try to launch a campaign to tackle those, um, what they call the bourgeois, or maybe you know, uh, the people from the Democratic Party, or highly educated people who refuse to launch collectivizations. So um, I want 550,000 people were named as the whiteys. And 11% uh, of the people actually, they receive high education, and the fifty is around 3 million people. Um, I mean, you have the caste struggle here. <laughs> but the caste struggle is not between the industrialists and, I mean, the workers. The, the caste struggle and the margin at that time is what well, this is what we call the antagonistic competition. I will come back with this term in the second lecture, but basically it means that you have different opinions on reform within a country. Some people would agree on that reform, and some people would say, no, I will have other means here. So that's why you know you want to tackle those people who would hear the reforms. And when you take up those people, when you clear, clear the road, and then you can launch another one of transformations, and this is the good thing forward. So uh, when you remove those people here, no more opposing voices, right? And then uh, that's why you have the good thing forward. So one of the factors, apart from the original domestic um, ideas, Mao would like to I mean, collectivize and would, try, would like to transform China to a communist country. Uh, another reason is about you know, uh, the Soviet factor. Because in 1957, uh, two things happened. Uh, one thing is about the Sputnik. The Sputnik is the Soviet uh, settlement. But this is the... I guess this is the first time that you have the uh, no. the first time that you have the second on, on in space, right? And it's done not only China but also the United States. <laughs> and uh, Marshall would think that it's time for us to catch up, okay? So we have to I mean pick up the pace here. But the second thing regarding the school is that you know if a country has a capability to send a satellite in space. It means that that missile, which should be the intercontinental ballistic missile, and if you have that capability, technically, if you also have the capability to put the Lincoln warheads on the missile, then it can be very dangerous. And this is the starting of the, I mean, nuclear armament race between the Soviet Union and the U.S. And the second thing I want to say is that you know, in the night in 1957, Marshall actually met with the Soviet leader. Uh, because because of the Sputnik, Marston would say that when when he met with the Soviet leader, Marston said that his win will be filled over the rest of it. Uh, the interpretation is that his win it represents China. The rest win is the rest. But the context of that statement is that Marston would like to have nuclear weapons. From the Soviet Union. And from the Soviet's perspective, nuclear weapons is not for a real use on the battlefield. They only want to make use of the nuclear weapons to deter the United States. But when Marjadon asks for nuclear weapons, Marjadon, uh, he wants to have, you know, uh, one thing, actually, they want to tackle the United States. The second thing, he wants to get back Taiwan. And then the Soviet leader would say that this is crazy. <laughs> Marjan is a crazy guy, and then the meeting went not very well. When Marjan returned to China, he criticized the Soviet Union then is the revisionist state, because they have the divergent path how to deal with the United States. Um, and thereafter, in late 1950s and early 1960s, the Soviet Union recalled all the scientists, technicians, and also the capitals from China. They didn't help China anymore. And 10 years later, in 1969, these two countries got a fight in northeastern part of China for a territorial conflict. So at that time, if you can put it all together, domestically, Mao Zedong wants to move China to a real communist state. But internationally, China feels that kind of passion. 
I want to catch up with the rest. But the Soviet Union, they have different ideas and different policies here. So that's why, you know, Mao Zedong would say that, you know, they the good step forward. One of the slogans is that, you know, we have to catch up with the United States, the United Kingdom, within 10 or 15 years, okay, or even supersede the United States. So this is a huge program here. Um, this is the propaganda here. Uh, you can see the poster here. But basically, this is about the People's Army. Uh, they want to, just like another Soviet Union, you have a school in here. Um, but the problem is that you can emerge if you work in a people, People's Army. People's Army, uh, you work in a, you know, just cooperatives. No, no payment, OK? You eat in a good dining hall. What's the mean for a good dining hall? Uh, the pace that we have breakfast this morning, this is not good dining hall because we have to pay, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I know to pay because of your generosity, right? But at that time in the people's coming, you do not have to pay. But the problem is that you know each one you will have certain amount of food, okay, because resources is limited, right? But imagine if you have no payment and you eat together, then you do have an incentive to work. Will you work hardly? Right? So this is the problem here. Um, then you may ask, why the Chinese leaders march down or the top is why they have no idea what's happening at the domestic level, right? Is this a question in your mind? If those people are not working, right? If the people's coming, you know, just couldn't, you know, go very well, then you should report to the Chinese leaders, the top Chinese leaders, right? So then I ask you another question. If you were the leader in a province or a leader in that kind of people's coming, would you try to tell your boss that, you know, the people's country just couldn't work very well. And we are dying soon. <laughs> are you going to say this to, to the top leader? So this is the problem. We have the misinformation between the top leaders and also, I mean, the real situations at the domestic level. The fake is actually reported the central government is a false state. And Marjorie actually thought that everything is very well. The data, the figures, you know, uh, the, the grains of, you know, productions here, uh, but actually, in 1959, in July, some people starved to death. And then you have reported cases that we, we have to put famine here. Um, so uh, another thing, apart from the rural sides, the you know, people's coming, you also have the, in the urban area or you know, in some you know, countryside, they also want to push up the industrial output. And then they try to ask all the people, no matter you have, in your, in your home, pick it up and then you put it into a backward third, you try to produce steel, right, uh, or iron, something like that, right? So you have uh, around 600,000 of backup furnace in 1958. So think about this. If you if you want to farm, you will need those, I mean, tools, right? But actually those people, they're poor, but they have to meet the target. They have to meet the, you know, steel production's target, so they put all their, you know, farming tools into the backward furnace, but actually no, no output because of the backward here. Poor technology, uh, no tools, no food, okay, so uh, the great famine happened and what? Well, this is the controversial figures here. If you refer to different readings or research, uh, but what I would say, you know, according to those readings here, if you combine together, uh, it killed 7 to 12 million people, uh, some 35 million people were purged, okay, so this is the situation for them to organize the poor backward furnace in the countryside. Uh, this is the figure, but still, this is debatable, I would say. I mean, uh, just like the numbers of the Red Guard. <laughs> no one would really tell uh, the actual figures here, but I mean, roughly, uh, if we refer to the source here, uh, this is from one of the books here, um, you can find that the figures here, uh, this is the mortality rate in China from 1956 to 1962, uh, China in general, and then in different provinces here. So basically, even for some what we call coastal province or advanced province like Guangdong, you also have that kind of you know um, starving situations and needless to say those uh, inland and backward province. Okay, so uh, this is for all your weapons here. So general, generally, I would say you know this is a disaster. And uh, after the Great Famine, um, Mao Zedong was forced to leave Beijing. The Great Famine is a very complicated issue in China. Someone would say, well, this is because of the poor management of Mao Zedong. But someone would argue this is caused by the natural disaster. 
because, I mean, in 1959 to 1960, when well, you have different natural designs, they different parts of China. So the party, the Trust Communist Party, defined the terms, but say that Marjadong, he, he, he committed fault. But not all of them, okay? Uh, some of the reasons about natural disaster. So that's why Marjadong, uh, he went to Shanghai, and then the leaderships um, were in the hands of the people. Um, Lao Zhaoqi, Chen Yuan, and this is Deng Xiaoping. And these three leaders actually offer some sort of economic incentive for those people to work hard within the people's help. Uh, so you have the increased figures of those, I mean, um, economic gains and productions later on here. Uh, but basically, Marjorie uh, he was not in Beijing. And he attempted to find a way back to Beijing later on. Uh, and then this is the Cultural Revolution. Um, I'm not going to too much details for the cultural revolutions because of the time constraints here, but I would say this is a very complicated issue. Um, if you want me to talk about this, you can ask for two lectures. Um, very briefly, um, two major arguments. One argument is that, you know, Mao Zedong, he truly believed in a confrontation, a continuous class struggle, that you can move China forward. And Mao Zedong was not happy with the, what we call the bourgeois policies uh, by Chen uh, Yuan, Lao Xiaoqi, and also Deng Xiaoping. And then he, he, he swam in Yangtze River uh, before he went back to Beijing. Uh, think about this, a leader, a national leader, swim in Yangtze River at, a, at, at the age of about you know, 60 something. Can you imagine this is going to happen? I mean, except Putin from Russia. <laughs> I couldn't imagine who's going to be, do the same thing here, right? But that time Mao Zedong swim in the Yangtze River, this is um, something published in the People's Daily, uh, the front page. And it shows that, you know, well, Yangtze River is the mother river of China, and then uh, Mao Zedong swim in the Yangtze River means that he has the temptations and he has the physical capability to continue the reform, right? And um, when he started the Cultural Revolutions, actually, uh, he made use of the drama to criticize one of the officers, and, and then later on you have the Red Dust, and then they, they, they try to, you know, uh, tackle those officers in different ministries, and then you have the revolutionary projects to take over the government. And this is the start of the Cultural Revolution. So that's, so that's why I would say two arguments. One would believe that Marjorie truly believe in organizing revolutions to move on, uh, to move the society forward. The second argument is about personal, uh, I mean, ambitions. He wants to get back to page the center, of Chinese politics. I, I will be quick, okay? So, uh, after the Cultural Revolu Revolution, um, some two million people were killed in China. Uh, and uh, Hua Gokong actually, he's the guy to arrest the gang of four uh, in the Cultural Revolution, and then he had the power at that time. But Hua Gokong, uh, he advocated the ideas to follow Mao Zedong's policy, which is something I mean, this built by Deng Xiaoping, and then later on you have the power struggle between Deng Xiaoping and Hua Gofeng. So Hua Gofeng later on, you know, he was removed. So Deng, Deng Xiaoping, you know, um, he became the top leader in China. And this is the end of the, you know, cultural revolution, and then you have the time to start another new page of China. So Deng Xiaoping appointed two persons. Uh, one is Hu Yaobang. So Hu Yaobang became the general secretary of the CCP. And another person is uh, Zhao Ziyang, so um, he's the premier. So Deng Xiaoping actually, he, he didn't want to hold any official post except one. Uh, this is the chairman of the Central Military Commission, which means he owns the military. But apart from that, Deng Xiaoping gave other posts to other colleagues. And then uh, supposedly these two guys, Hu Yaobang and Zhao Ziyang, will be responsible for the economic reform and later on. But the problem uh, in the 1980s is that when you open up China economically, there were too many problems. Um, when you have the economic reform, some people, they, uh, they're getting richer and richer. And then you have the gap between the poor and, I mean, the rich people. And then you have the discontent from those workers. They thought that we have never been benefited from the economic reform. And then the second, uh, class of these content people, they were the students. The students thought that only economic reform is not enough. Because when you have the open door policy, not only 
if the economic uh, products or trade, you also invest other ideologies and values for the West. So that's why the students, they would argue that, you know, apart from economic reform, we want something more. We want transparency, we want even democracy. And this is why you have the anti bourgeois liberalization campaign. The Chinese top leaders, especially for the hawkish leaders, they would think it's the time to stop. We open too much, okay, um, to the society, and you have the setback, you have the discontent for the people, and we couldn't control. So people like the our gym will suffer in the long run. So that's why Hui Bong was removed, and then um, Zhao Jian became the top leader after you know uh, Hui Bong, and he still continued the economic reform with coastal development strategy and also export-led growth policy. Uh, but the problem is that the students still demand for more democracy, transparency, and then you have the people's, uh, sorry, you have the students' protest. Uh, but the problem is that the people state aid regard the students' protest as a don't know. It means revolutionary. That you have a problem. If you are a student, if you participate in the protest, and the government said, well, the protest you participate, this is this is a revolutionary. And then every student fear that you know when we go back to campus we will be arrested. So that's why the student, because of that editorial, they wouldn't retreat. They would even participate further in the protest by arguing that they want to have the redefinitions of that movement. It's not revolutionary, it's the patriotic you know, movement in China. Uh, but of course, the hunger strike organized by students, you know, um, it, 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 it actually wants to, I mean, um, we more to find that at the top of the people's state is not successful. The Chinese leaders at that time, they split into two, I mean, groups. One group, they, they were quite sympathetic at the students. But the other group, just like Yang Sanquan, he's the president of China at that time, he's the hawkish. So the two groups, you know, at that time, they just couldn't reach a consensus how do we deal with the student movement. And then they, they just, you know, let the students stay in Tiananmen Square. Um, but unfortunately, when, I mean, uh, the Soviet leader Gorbachev, when he fixed Beijing, actually, this is embarrassed because, you know, he, I mean, Gorbachev, he, he, he didn't expect this happened to him. <laughs> Originally, the, the ceremony would be, I mean, scheduled in the Tiananmen Square for welcoming a state leader. But, you know, they moved out the paces. Uh, some students, they suspect that the Clearance of the Tiananmen Square would happen at the time of the Gorbachev was, but it didn't happen. And somehow it even led the students to have more determination to stay and to bargain with the government. Until Zhao Ziyang visited the Tiananmen Square too late. Zhao Ziyang, he was in North Korea in a visit. His friend Wan Li, a liberal, uh, was sent to Latin America for state visit. So technically, the liberals in the party, they were isolated. And then you have the hawkish people, they work with Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping actually, you know, um, he, he thought that, well, this is enough. If you have the revolution movement, then we have to stop. And then the, the army actually, you know, uh, well, I have a story because, you know, the army near Beijing actually, they, they knew the news. They sympathetic to the students. And the army near Beijing area, they didn't move. They rejected the order. But when you have another group of army from other provinces, they have no idea what's happening in Beijing. They shoot, they kill. Because the information given to, to them, this is the revolution movement. So uh, he arrived too late, and then later on, he was under house arrest. And uh, uh, this is one job about, you know, in a younger stage here. So um, anyway, but this is the June 4th. Um, so after that, I'm going to finish within two minutes, OK? So after June 4th, um, Deng Xiaoping appointed another person. Uh, he's uh, Zhang Zemin. Okay. But Deng Xiaoping also would try to make sure that economic reform should be continued, but not political reform. Uh, he even launched a southern trip to Shenzhen, which is just next to Hong Kong, by saying that we should look at the example of Shenzhen to have economic reform. But the political message is very clear. If you do not follow the party, the party's line to have economic reform, <coughs> then you will be removed. And then uh, all the countries just try to work for the economic reform. And Zhang Zemin was summoned to Beijing because he did one thing in Shanghai in June 4th. 
uh, there's a newspaper in Shanghai who pays thanks to the students' movement. And uh, the next day, uh, 5th of June, Jiang Zemin, without any, I mean, uh, communication with the central government, he cracked down that newspaper. And then Jiang Zemin would say, well, this is a tough guy, a good guy, so let's uh, find him to be the next leader. And then he was suddenly summoned to the page, so this is a, I mean, <laughs> how can you say this? This is a very odd circumstances here. But anyway, uh, Jiang Zemin basically followed Deng's idea. Uh, economic reform without political uh, reform. And then uh, China has a steady growth at, at that time. And then uh, Hu Jintao is a kind of man. He follows the policy. Uh, the principles are the origins. He's not something really significant. Because he's a technocrat, he's not the man who has been the long march. Okay, um, so the policy is the same when you compare with Jiangzemin. But Xi Jinping, this is different. Because when Xi Jinping took the leadership, he has a lot of resources in terms of the China's economic capability, in terms of you know the, the China's established infrastructure. Here you can do many many things. So the problem in well, let's do this with the one. The problem for Deng Xiaoping is whether you know we should move forward for economic reform or we just you know step back to have a rather isolated backward trying for socialist you know economy. Uh, but when he make when he makes the money, it's okay. Economic reform then is fine. So the problem for Jiang Zemin is how to keep up or how to I mean make sure the economic reform would be continued a substan a substantial. This is the problem here. So Hu Jintao similar. How can you make sure that the economic reform is going to benefit every people in China? You can level down the gap between rich and poor, the gap between Indian provinces and coastal provinces. Mm -hmm. But the question for Xi Jinping is not these questions. We're too rich. We have money. We have infrastructure. We have influence. How should we spend those money? How should we make use of the influence? How, how should we project the Chinese influence in the overseas? So you can imagine you have different mindsets for those Chinese things. But basically, this is a very brief, I mean, timeline for the development of the Chinese policy. I will come back for the ideologies and uh, parties later on in the second lecture. Thank you.